गुड आफ्टरनून वेलकम टू वीक फाइव ऑफ दिस एनपीटेल कोर्स ऑन कोहरेंस एंड कोआडम एंटैंगलमेंट बिफोर प्रोसीडिंग टू दिस वीक्स असाइनमेंट प्रॉब्लम लेट एस रीविजिट द लास्ट प्रॉब्लम फ्रॉम द प्रीवियस वीक this is because uh, we could not complete this problem last time due to lack of time so let us begin with problem 3 from the previous week let me read the question for you the question is consider a spatially coherent constant amplitude plane wave field the field is temporally Uh, temporally stationary with the spectral density given by this uh, expression which is gaussian in nature with omega not greater than greater than delta omega that means it is uh, quasi monochromatic suppose you are given a young double slit setup the separation between the two slits is 2d and the distance to the screen is r with r much larger than d as shown in the figure this is the figure over here for the young double slit setup the size of the two slits are negligibly small and then describe how one can uh, one could find the frequency bandwidth delta omega of the field by measuring the intensity ix on the screen as a function of x so this is my figure this is the young double slit setup we have two slits over here separated by a distance 2d in the plane z equal to 0 we have the screen in the plane z equal to r and we want to measure the intensity over here as a function of spatial position on the screen x and by measuring this intensity we want to find out the bandwidth delta omega of the input source so before a rigorous treatment of this problem let me give you an intuitive feeling for this problem so in school we have studied the young double slit experiment for a perfectly monochromatic light source light source which is perfectly monochromatic and spatially perfectly coherent as well so the intensity for this perfectly monochromatic spatially coherent source as we have studied in school is given as follows now this can also be written as follows in terms of x delta over here is the phase difference i not is the intensity from each slit and we can write delta as follows it is 2 pi by lambda times path difference path difference is 2d x by r basically 2d tan theta approximately 2d tan theta and tan theta would be x over r to d x over r so this gives delta over 2 equals omega
and how we get omega that's because 2 pi by lambda equals k which is omega over c so now this is for a particular uh, frequency omega and since we have different frequencies so the intensity contribution from each frequency will be governed by the spectral uh, by this spectral density s omega So, uh, the intensity for a particular frequency will be the amplitude term will be this. Uh, s omega i and then this 4 uh, so basically instead of i naught we will replace it with s omega and plugging in the expression for s omega So what will happen is each omega will each omega i frequency will form fringes of its own. And then the resultant will be a superposition or the overlap. So then let us look at mm, fringes formed by each frequency. So this is the intensity versus x for a particular omega. Let us say this is some particular value of omega, delta omega, omega i and omega naught. Now let us look at some other omega. Let me copy paste this. So if I'm looking at some other frequency, 
the amplitude will be different the frequency will also be different amplitude will be different based on s omega this s omega i and frequency that will be omega i So let us say this is for some uh, omega naught remains the same delta omega is the same but omega i is less than omega naught in this case that's why the amplitude is low and the frequency is also lower now let us we will look at the mathematica simulations for the same and what we will do in Mathematica simulations is after we look at the individual frequencies for each omega i, we will then add them up. We will add all the intensities according to the S omega, the spectral density and then we will see some pattern. So, let us go to the Mathematica window and try to see the simulations. So I am here in my Mathematica window. So this is the plot of the spectral density function that I have taken. Omega naught I have taken as 100 and delta omega as 10. So this is the spectral density function. Maybe I can label the axes so that it becomes clearer. I'm sorry, what is happening? Oh, sorry, there is, I, huh, sorry. Okay, yeah, so this is the plot of my spectral density function, S omega. So on the x-axis, I have omega, on the y-axis, I have S omega, and you see that this spectral density function is centered about omega naught, which is 100. So this is the point of my omega naught, which is 100. And the width is 10, which is delta omega, the width of this uh, plot. Next, let us look at the intensity plots for each specific frequency. So here, this is for omega equals 100, which is the same as omega naught. That's why the amplitude is going all the way up to 1. If I change this omega, this is omega i essentially. See, it goes down. Let me call it omega i so that there is no confusion. In our notation, this omega over here is omega i. Okay. Yeah. See, as, uh, as omega i deviates from omega naught, the amplitude goes down and also of course the frequency changes according to omega i if i reduce omega i even further see the amplitude goes down even further why because in this s omega 
plot you see for omega equals 100 it is maximum value but if omega deviates from 100 the amplitude starts to fall down and about let's say over here somewhere about 70 the amplitude is very nearly zero so if i put in 70 see the amplitude goes down nearly to zero if i put in 60 it's even less see because it's a gaussian it just tends to very close to zero not exactly zero but very close to zero so this is how the intensity plot is for each of the different frequencies see this is more than 100 more than 100 also the amplitude falls down of course the frequency increases as you can clearly see so this is the plot for each of the individual frequencies now let us add each of these frequencies so here i am adding frequencies starting from frequency 80 ending to frequency 120 and let me add them in step sizes of 10 and then let me plot it so this is how the plot is looking now if i reduce the step size so 80 to 120 in step sizes of 10 would mean 80 90 100 110 and 120 now let me make the step size smaller as you can see the this periodicity of repetition increases uh, increases so now the this pattern repeats after a greater distance if i reduce the step size even further you see that the repetition starts at an even greater distance if the step size is even smaller then at least within this range the pattern is not repeating step size equals 1 and this is how the plot will look like so this was a very intuitive way of uh, trying to understand what is happening so we have the spectral density then we have the plots for each of the individual frequencies and then when we add them up together this is what we see so this will be uh, like what this will be like the pattern that we will see after the young's double slit setup if the input light is of the form of this quasi monochromatic light which has this particular form of the spectral density function so let us now get back to our no so we come back to our lecture notes and we saw this intuitive way of trying to see what happens when light of this particular form of spectral density function actually falls on this double slit setup. Now let us do a rigorous mathematical analysis for the same. So, uh, let the field at the screen at location x and z distance r that will be given as follows. That will be sum of the fields uh, coming from each of the slits, each of the two slits 
for the first slit that's the contribution then this is for the second slit and this is because I'm taking the origin over here so this point is plus D this point is minus D so that's why plus D and minus D that's the contribution from each of the slits time taken for the field to reach from slit, slit 1 to the screen is R1 by C where this distance is R1 and this distance is R2 that will be given as follows This is because R is much much larger than D. That's why we are able to use this binomial approximation. Similarly, we can write for time taken from slit 2. And because the field is temporally stationary, stationary, so all the, uh, the correlation functions will be independent of time. And there is no correlation between each of the frequencies. And also there is spatial coherence. So we can write down the intensity at the screen as contribution from the first slit plus contribution from the second slit plus the uh, degree of coherence function, the cross term. Now, the cross correlation function will be given as the Fourier transform of the cross spectral density function
and upon integrating we get the following result this comes from the previous assignment this result please go and check that assignment for this result this is basically integrating this s omega over here s omega e to the power minus i omega tau d omega over minus infinity to plus infinity so this particular integral gives this result this we had derived in the previous assignment so now We can find degree of coherence function also. That's because I zero is nothing but tau of zero, which is one. So this is my degree of coherence function, which is the same as cross correlation function. This means that the argument is omega naught tau from here. Thus, my final expression for intensity can be written as follows. I0 is 1. So, simply k1 squared mod k2 squared Now, let me find out the expression for tau. Tau is t2 minus t1 and we have found t2 and t1 in terms of x. I am just simplifying. So, this simply means that tau is proportional to x. So, finally, we have the intensity in terms of the screen coordinate x. Now, from this intensity, we see that there is this exponential term over here and 
the width of this exponential term is proportional to 1 over delta omega. In fact, the exact expression of the width is cr over 2d delta omega. So, once you find out the width of the intensity pattern, you will know the value of delta omega from the width. So, if you measure the intensity pattern on the screen, if you find the width of that intensity pattern, then from that you can directly get the frequency bandwidth. Now, let us look at the Mathematica simulations for the same. So, I am back here in my Mathematica screen and here I have written down the expression for the intensity. This is as a function of tau, that is because tau is simply proportional to x. So, let me run this. And you see this is the plot which is structurally similar to what we had obtained using our intuitive method. In the intuitive method also we obtained a similar uh, kind of plot and this plot is for the mathematically rigorous method. So, once you find the width of this uh, plot, the width is governed by this exponential envelope. Let me plot the envelope also. Oh, sorry, I need to add one to it. Yeah, so this is my envelope function. You see this envelope is basically tangentially connecting uh, all these peak locations. And the width of this envelope function uh, will be basically uh, inversely proportional to the frequency bandwidth. So, once you find this width, then uh, using that expression, the width is equals CR over 2D delta omega. From this expression, you can find delta omega. So, delta omega is nothing but width times 2D over CR. So, that is how you can find out the frequency bandwidth from the width of the intensity plot on the screen. Okay, so uh, this was all about this question wherein we were given a source which was spatially completely coherent and temporally stationary and had this particular spectral density function and when this passed through the Young's double slit setup, we observed the intensity pattern on the screen and from that intensity pattern on the screen, we can actually find out the frequency bandwidth. So that was all about this question from the previous week that is week 4. Now that it is complete, we can move to the current week that is week 5's assignment problems. So, let me open the notes for week 5. Okay, so now we are in the week 5 notes. Let us look at the first problem for week 5. 
so the first one is on wolf equation which is basically for propagation of cross correlation function cross spectral density uh, so cross correlation function and then we have to derive the wolf's equation for the cross spectral density function then part b is uh, we are given the propagation equation for the cross spectral density function and then we have to assume that r2 minus r1 over c is much smaller compared to the coherence time of the source and that the cross spectral density function is centered about a mean frequency and has a quasi monochromatic spectrum then we have to derive the propagation equation for the cross correlation function gamma so uh, this is mostly on propagation of the correlation functions and the cross spectral density functions please take about a minute to read and digest this question before i finally discuss the solution with all of you Okay, so let me start discussing. So, so the cross correlation function is essentially a Fourier transform of the cross spectral density function. So now this gamma is Fourier transform of omega. So let me write that down. Fourier transform. So this is uh, taking, uh, this is just replacing gamma as the Fourier transform of W on both the sides.
this is because omega square over c square is k square so this is what we get as the propagation for the cross spectral density function similarly for the other coordinate derivative with respect to coordinate 2 This is for the other coordinate also. Similarly, we will get. Now, we can proceed to part B. So let's call this equation 2. This is what we are given. Now, for the cross correlation function, to get the cross correlation function, we will take Fourier transform of equation 2. So, let us do that. And K is omega by C. Now for quasi-monochromatic.
so now we will plug it uh, this uh, quasi monochromatic condition Now again we will make use of this given approximation. So, because of the quasi monochromatic condition, we are replacing this omega with the mean omega plus a small uh, bandwidth. Now, so from this condition over here, so this is much, much smaller than 1. So that means this term is approximately equal to 1.
so finally this fourier transform is nothing but the cross correlation function Omega by C is K. This is because K is Omega by C. So this completes question number one, which was on propagation of cross spectral density function and uh, the correlation function. Take about a minute to just go through this question and to recapitulate. Okay, so let us move to the next question. Problem 2. The angular correlation function for the Gaussian shell model pump field is given by the following expression. We need to show that the cross spectral density function is as follows this big expression over here. Okay, wait, I think there is a typo in this. So, The square root is only up until the first two uh, exponentials. So we need to show that the cross spectral density function for the Gaussian shell model is this expression over here. And this is at z equal to zero. Sigma mu is the transverse coherence width at z equal to 0. And transverse coherence width means the distance scale over which the field at z equal to 0 remains spatially coherent. And then we need to calculate uh, for the far field as well. That is very large z, the far field expression for the cross spectral density function.
and we can take the central wave vector to be k naught. Again, just take about a minute to read the question again before I solve. Okay, so let us start solving. So let us call this equation 1. So let all these expressions I'll uh, combine and call as equation 2. Now I'll put in the value of this a, this function which is the angular correlation function.
now i'll represent in cartesian coordinates Now, uh, in this equation 3, let us first consider the integral over q1x. So, I am just simplifying it now. This question is algebraically intense. Now, uh, after this, we will consider the integral over the Q2x.
okay so let me write down this gaussian integral that i have made use of and this is very important There's a minus sign. This is the Gaussian integral, and it's super important. Please memorize this. And we will be using this Gaussian integral frequently, like now. Now we can combine the integrals over q1x and q2x.
and we will ignore the constant I'm just doing algebraic manipulation. Stop me if I make some mistake in this manipulation while copying from first line to the next line. And I'm using these identities. And row 2 minus row 1 is delta rho. So this is for the x coordinate integral. Similarly, we will have for the y coordinate integral.
Now we will combine both the x and y integrals. Let us call this equation 4. Now we need to simplify the expressions of these arguments, these alpha minus beta terms. So we are given what is alpha and beta over here. So from this.
now let us take the ratio alpha minus beta over alpha squared minus beta squared Now the other term this over here beta over alpha squared minus beta squared. So putting all of this together we will get the final expression for the cross spectral density. So this is the final expression and it is the same as what we were supposed to uh, derive. So notice that the square root is there. So when you transfer the square root to the exponential, what it becomes is that this denominator from 2 becomes 4. So that is what we have. Rho 1 squared over 4. Same over here. Rho 2 squared over 4 it will become when we transfer the square root inside. And that's what we have over here. Now we will move to part B that is propagation to large Z.
now we will put in the expression for this angular correlation function Let's call it equation 6. Now, again we will consider integral over q1x.
so here I am substituting alpha prime as alpha plus i z over 2 k naught Now we can consider the integral over q2x. Now again let me, uh, so from here we had made this alpha prime substitution, so the complex conjugate of that will be this. So this alpha minus i z over 2 k naught that is alpha uh, alpha prime complex conjugate. And again we will make use of this Gaussian integral over here.
this is making use of that Gaussian integral. Now we can combine uh, uh, both the integrals over q1x and q2x. And we can ignore the constant because constant is just a scaling factor. It's a nor normalization. So the x coordinate. integral will become uh, the following by combining integrals over q1x and q2x
I am just simplifying it, doing some algebraic manipulations. So, mod alpha prime squared is alpha prime times alpha prime conjugate, complex conjugate. So, that's why I'm writing alpha prime, taking alpha prime common here and then alpha prime conjugate over here. So, let me call this equation number 7. So, this is the x coordinate integral. Similarly, we can write the y coordinate integral. So, let us call this equation number 8. Now, we need to find out these expressions, alpha prime squared, beta squared and this alpha, minus alpha prime conjugate plus beta and all these ratios. So, let us do that one by one. So, alpha prime is defined over here, alpha plus i z over 2k naught. So, mod alpha prime squared is the following. Now, alpha squared we are given in the very beginning over here.
this is coming because beta also we are given beta is this now we need to find this alpha prime squared minus beta squared over beta Okay, I think I'm writing, someone is saying I'm writing too small. Okay, let me make at least this part a little bit bigger. Because this part is important. especially this equation 7 and 8 let me separate this part also because I don't want to mix up the things Now, for the far field, Z is very large. And we can ignore the other term. this other term in front of z so then that would mean 4 times because there is this factor 4 Ignoring this first term, so that means only z squared is there in the numerator. So this 4 will cancel out and we have z squared, k0 squared and then beta squared. So, thus uh, we have found this uh, coefficient of this delta rho term, delta rho x squared and delta rho y squared. And so, this delta rho term we can write down.
so delta rho squared is this x coordinate and y coordinate contributions from both the x and y coordinates and the sigma mu z is sigma mu at a distance z Okay, wait, I think I am. somewhere a factor of 2 I am okay so there's a 2 over here Okay, wait somewhere. And yeah, okay. Yeah, now it is fine. Now, we need, so this is for delta rho term. Now, the other terms, this first and second term, row 1 and row 2 terms this is equation 9 
now some terms will cancel two k not here two k not and this term with this term Now again, because we are in the far field, Z is very large, so we will ignore this term. So I have already ran out of time. So let us just quickly finish this. And this term will be sigma S Z. Now further, this is for the row 1 term, row 1 term. Now this row 2 term also has this uh, similar term. We need to find that. It's the complex conjugate of this. So the complex conjugate minus becomes plus. And why this is complex conjugate and how I'm writing this. So beta and mod alpha prime squared are real. So then now what we will do is we will plug in these expressions. Uh, this expression over here and this expression over here we will plug these two into equations 7 and 8 this 7 and 8 over here these terms are there this term this term we will plug it into 7 and 8 and then we will combine it with 9 to get the desired result so So we will then get the final result.
a constant So, this is the final expression and notice that this expression, this uh, cross spectral density at z is similar to the cross spectral density at z equal to 0, this one over here. Only difference is that each of these terms, this sigma mu squared, sigma s squared is uh, replaced by their corresponding terms at some finite z instead of z equal to 0. So, this at z. Okay, so that is all for today. Uh, we have already overshot the time. So, we will meet next week and then we will discuss some more problems. Uh, this angular interference and uh, a question based on this particular problem for finite um, basically for a coherence length which is uh, not dependent on z we will do these questions in the next week okay thank you very much